Hi, and welcome to this event uh, on AI as a sustainability enabler. We're very happy to see you. This is uh, the kickoff event of a series of events that is coming. And we are going to focus on how AI can be an enabler for sustainability, for how organizations can use AI to become more sustainable. We're also today specifically going to look at how far along are we, what different stages do we need to go through and what is required to do to actually use AI um, to become more sustainable. We're very happy to have a great panel. We also have a keynote speaker. And when I say we, uh, we are quite a few different organizations hosting this together. And that's why we wanted to make it into a series of events. My name is Ebba Josefsson Lindqvist, and I'm wearing two of the co-host hats today. First of all, I'm representing as an organization called Silicon Vikings. Uh, we have our headquarters in Silicon Valley, started about 20 years ago, but we also have nodes throughout the new Nordic countries. I'm director of Nordic Nodes, and Silicon Vikings is a networking organization supporting innovation and tech by doing networking events and connecting entrepreneurs, VCs, etc hosting pitch events um, and this kind of panel discussions, for example. I'm also part of AI Sweden. Um, and AI Sweden is an organization that has the mission to increase the use of apply, applied AI in Sweden for the benefit of our society, Sweden's competitiveness and for everyone living in Sweden. And as I mentioned, we also have a few other host organizations with us today. And first of all, I want to welcome Natasha Palm from Nordic Innovation House Silicon Valley. Good morning, Natasha. Good morning, Eva, and thank you very much for this great event and for the great introduction. Thank uh, you. And, and uh, what is Nordic Innovation House? Yes, Nordic Innovation House is a Nordic collaboration, and um, we Sweden is a uh, Vinova is the Swedish representative in the Nordic Innovation House, and we have a number of members, uh, which are mostly companies. And so we work with members to support members, but we also run different programs, uh, accelerator, incubator, and other initiatives, uh, and also promote long-term collaboration between Sweden and and Silicon Valley. And um, yeah, uh, I would like to say that um, also that besides from Nordic Innovation House, uh, Vinova also uh, works a lot and focuses on making, creating long-term collaborations. And one great example is, for example, Nordic Intech, which automation region and process of IT and automation are, are driving. So we really want to work to internationalize Vinova's portfolio with the help of, uh, of, of Silicon Valley. That's great. Thank you so much, Natasha. We're really happy to do this event series together with you guys. And that's how we really can bridge over these different ecosystems, the Silicon Valley and the new Nordics. So very excited to, to start this collaboration with you. Thank you Thank very you much. So much. We're very excited for, for this event to be kicked off and looking forward to, um, to, to the whole series. Thank you so much. And now, uh, next up, we will have Katarina Berglund and Peter Wallin from Automation Hi. Region and from PIA. Hi, Hi. Katarina. Hi, lovely to be a part of this series of events together. <laughs> My name is Thank Katarina Berglund. And I'm the manager of Automation Region. Automation Region are more than 170 active members, partners, company of different sizes, put together with academia, institute and society, work in the area of intech for green conversion. So therefore, we are, of course, particularly excited about this type of activity on the intech flag because it's needed for sustainable smart factory and digital transformation. Right, Peter? Yes, that's true. Uh, so, and I'm Peter Wallin, and I'm responsible for the PIA program, the Process Industrial IT and Automation program. So, basically, we're trying to digitize the, the process industry, which you all know is a fairly it's a complex complex industry with, with a lot of legacy systems. 
And we have since the start invested together with industry, invested roughly 1 billion sec in research and innovation projects with the aim to strengthen this competitiveness that we have in Sweden. Uh, and we have a term that we've founded together with Automation Reading and Blue Institute that's called Intech. And we, we think this is a really good term to, to actually describe this uh, new era of collaboration uh, where you actually see this, these legacy systems from, from industry uh, trying to utilize these new technologies and look how it changes not only the technology, but also the business models and, and how we interact and how we do business in the future. And I think also that Intech is really an enabler for being uh, trying to achieve a sustainable industry. I mean, you need to digitize processes. And, and the, one of these new technologies that we look into quite a lot is AI and you should say the, the focus for this event. Uh, so do you want to add something, Katarina? Maybe no, some no. Words about our Silicon Valley great. initiative. We are both so happy to be here together with you and uh, making this event and series of event uh, and more, more activities together. We need that. Thank you so much, Katarina and Peter. And maybe we should also uh, do a shout out to Mina Sandberg, who is also working with Indtech, uh, who has really helped out to uh, create this event and, and preparing everything for today. Um, and for the audience, I want to mention that we are recording this webinar, just so you know. And we will be also releasing it on our different channels afterwards. So it's possible to go back and have a look or even share with others that might want to uh, see this or, or are interested in how AI can be part of making our uh, organizations more sustainable. We will also have the Q&A function. Um, so if you look at the button tab uh, of your screen, you will see the Q&A function and also the chat function. We'll keep a close eye there. If you have any questions uh, for the keynote speaker, because we'll have about 20 minutes presentation and then we'll follow up with uh, about 15 minutes for questions. So please start uh, as soon as Victor Gallas gets started um, to shoot some questions for us. Same goes for the panel. Uh, please be active, uh, use this time to ask your questions to the panelists and, and I'll blend them in in the panel discussion. So with that, um, I want to say welcome to Victor Gallas. Hi, Victor. Hi, hi, hi everyone. Good to see you. Great to have you here. You are from Stockholm Resilience Center and you have promised to give us uh, your perspective on how AI can be a sustainability enabler. So we're really looking forward to hearing your presentation. And I'm saying again, please audience type in some questions so we can have an interactive discussion with uh, Victor afterwards. But uh, Victor, please go ahead. Let's see if we can see your screen first, uh, uh, your PowerPoint slides. There you go. You should be able to see it. Right. Yes, that looks great. Thank you Excellent. so much. I'll mute in the meantime, but please go ahead. Thank you all. Uh, well, I mean, I'm not seeing you directly, but it's good, good to be invited and, and give a little bit of my, my take on this very, very big, big topic. I think in general, I always like to, to start with an overview of what we're facing. Why are we talking about sustainability? What's the role of AI in that transition? And I'm just going to show you this graph quickly uh, that was um, published a couple of years ago that shows the state of, of the climate and how climate has changed on planet earth going back all the way 60 million years ago and what i think is important to note here is the fact that something happened on planet earth around 10,000 years ago 11,000 years ago which is this state the mid holocene which is an unusually stable state on the earth's climate and this is where we as a species managed to prosper. We built uh, democracy, technologies, agriculture, business, et cetera, on this stable uh, climate regime. The problem is of course, that we're moving very, very quickly outside of what we're designing our societies to cope with. And this is why Glasgow in November is so important in international climate negotiations, because we know as, as we move outside of this, stable phase in the climate system, it will have impacts on everything. It will impact on agriculture, on biodiversity, on our oceans and our economies in very, very profound ways. And I think AI and technological change has the ability to help us cope with this if we get it right. I think that's a big if. 
something that I want to add to the to the conversation because I, I noticed whenever you talk about technology and you talk about artificial intelligence and sustainability, people tend to focus a lot on energy and fossil fuels. I want to add an additional dimension to this, which is the biosphere. And the biosphere is the living planet. So it's it's forests, oceans, landscapes, savanna, grasslands, etc. And this little piece by by uh, Johan Rockström that came out a couple of weeks ago. What they note, and don't get too stuck into the details, is the fact that if we didn't have a living biosphere, so again, the forests and landscapes and the oceans, actually, we would already now be hitting the Paris target of one and a half degrees warming compared to pre-industrial time. We would already be there. We're not there yet, but we would already be there without the biosphere. And by 2050, we would be at two and a half degrees, which is way, way over the Paris target. So whenever I talk about the climate challenge, whenever I talk about sustainability, I talk about not only fossil fuels, I also talk about the living planet. I think to me that's super important and I will get back to that uh, a bit later. What is interesting to note uh, whenever we talk about sustainability is the fact that we have this biosphere and without the biosphere, actually Earth would only be a dead rock floating around in space. But on top of that, we have the technosphere. And this is what technologies have done with a planet. And the technosphere, there was an attempt to actually try to assess the size of the technosphere is around 30 trillion tons. And you see 30 with <laughs> loads of zeros. And if you spread that even on, on the surface of Earth, there would be 50 kilos of technology and infrastructure uh, of every square meter of the Earth's surface. Now, what I find fascinating in this context, whenever we talk about smart technologies or data-driven analysis, AI sensors, is the fact that this technosphere is not only just dead mass anymore. And some people would say that it's becoming increasingly cognitive because it measures, it senses, it nudges behavior, it analyzes, it communicates with us and with each other. And this development of the technosphere, not only being big in size, but also becoming increasingly cognitive is because of developments in artificial intelligence. A lot of it is just part of technological development in itself, but a lot of it is also driven by investment. So I just put together a couple of numbers here. Uh, this is from a book manuscript that I'm working on at the moment. The UK just announced a new national AI strategy uh, with climate change being one of the key areas where they focus on. Germany has committed billions of euros France, the same thing, the US, similar things. Canada has a super cluster of new technologies, one of it being a focus on AI uh, and associated technologies. China has a very ambitious uh, policies on developing AI to, to create it as the next frontier for economic development with aspects touching on, on climate change and the living planet associated with it. Another aspect that I think is important and, and that we tend to forget is the fact that developments in artificial intelligence and associated technologies will not only come top down through government investment, it's just part of technological change. Uh, I think some Swedish colleagues call this infusion. So infusion means that suddenly technologies that didn't use AI start to use AI with us not even thinking about it. So for example, on Instagram, uh, and this is an example from, from uh, Emma Engstrom and, and uh, Ponte Strimling, uh, is the fact that in 2018, uh, Instagram feeds and the way that, that the feed was filtered did not use deep learning at all. It was just very simply, simple statistical machine learning uh, systems. But in two, 2019, suddenly that system was changed to deep learning and included AI. AI. Of course, none, no one here, I would guess, knew that was happening. It was just infused in technology. So that's another process. It's not only government investments, it's just technological change and AI being infused in, in technologies that we're using today invisibly. So whenever I think about AI, and maybe this is a big thing, uh, way to think about it is that people normally would say, think about AI as something specific that solves a specific challenge that over, uh, comes human intelligence and on specific bits and pieces. For me, whenever we talk about AI and the benefits of AI for sustainability, 
I think we need to think bigger. I think we need to think broad, meaning that AI will impact all sectors of relevance for sustainability. Finance, healthcare, education, climate modeling, ecological monitoring, etc. All aspects of society. It will be ubiquitous in, in terms of infusion, as I mentioned. It will be invisible. It will be everywhere in ways that we don't even think about it. And the last part I think is important, even though I will not uh, dive too deep into that, it will be deep because these systems will shape our perceptions, our memories, and our emotional world. If you just think about social media and the way we interact in social media, the way we get memories in, in Google Photos, for example, the way we interact and, and, and connect with people is shaped by these technologies increasingly. So, so don't think about AI and sustainability as something puzzles that you find here and there. It will be infused, it will be everywhere in many sectors. And then of course, if you work in this sector, uh, especially for this audience, think about this as an immense opportunity. I mean, if you think about the size of the technosphere, the vast challenge that we're facing in climate change, the opportunity of getting this right by directing the development of AI. But it's also an immense responsibility for us and people in, in the tech sector. Make sure to get it right. Make sure that you get the right direction, that, that you tackle real sustainability challenges. So, so uh, I would beg you to keep that in mind, the opportunity, but also the responsibility on this sector. What we're seeing now, um, and, and, and as a scientist here, um, and I'm just gonna show you a little bit, uh, the fact that technologies are moving so quickly into what we study, both here on the left side, conservation technology, meaning the sensors and, and ways to measure things that are happening in the environment in totally new ways that we haven't seen before. And then on the right side, just the massive amounts of data, climate data, land use data, um, temperature, it, it's just massive. And the, the challenge is, of course, what, what are we going to do with all this data? And this is why AI suddenly becomes an important part of our toolbox to understand and also in the longer term change, change the world. Uh, I'm just going to give you a few examples of how this works. So this is from Marcus Reinstein's article. So if you have, for example, on, on the top uh, left corner here, you have a machine learning task that is about classifying images, like cat. Is this a cat or a dog? You've seen that before, probably. You can actually use similar types of of, of uh, AI system to automatically classify tornadoes in real time on satellite images. It's the same technical challenge, but of use for the climate and sustainability challenge. The same with super resolution and fusion data where you have sparse data or, or when you're trying to find something much more fine grained, you can use similar technologies to actually downscale all these global models that we have to local levels and, and make much better assessments of how the local level will be affected by, for example, climate change. And then video prediction, uh, which has become much more refined lately. Uh, so instead of using video prediction to, to try to predict what will happen in a, on, in a video where you see a couple jogging uh, along a beach, as you see on the left side, you can use it for short term forecasting of weather changes. And that particular last point has evolved very, very quickly, just the last months, I would say. So massive potential. And then of course, the, the challenge is, so how do you make use of that to support a, a transition towards sustainability and a stable climate system? So just one example that I found super intriguing, uh, it's called Carbon Tracker from 2018. And what they do is that they can buy satellite images and have designed an AI a model to assess the activity of uh, coal power stations in China. And that, that data has been missing. I mean, there's no national interest in, in sharing that data, but, but combining satellite images and then teach an AI model to see the vapor plumes coming out from particular parts of a region, then you can assess how active that power plant is. And then you can actually show that these power plants that run in, on coal at the moment are not economically viable. And, and you can show that using that type of analysis. In terms of adaptation, 
there's been a big, big challenge in our community to try to assess how many people will be affected by flooding and, and rising sea levels. It sounds like a simple challenge, but uh, analytical challenge, but it, in fact, it, it is not. There's so many interactive variables. It's a very dynamic uh, landscape where you have elevations, you have urban centers uh, changing over time. And actually by using uh, neural networks, uh, a new study 2018 could drastically update the numbers of, of people that are at risk for, for flooding by 2050, thanks to new methods. And of course, since I know you're all interested in organizational innovation and business models, et cetera, there are a couple of ideas and, and studies out there that I find interesting uh, from the Ellen McCarthy Foundation 2019. They made a deep dive into the fashion and textile industry amongst others, and then explore the potential of using AI to innovate in materials, to innovate in the way that supply chains and infrastructures are designed, and maybe even the way that businesses are run to support circular business models using data-driven AI analysis. I find this in incredibly intriguing, even though I would say it's at the conceptual level and pilot level, look at the potential here. There have been a couple of, of assessments uh, made trying to make a global um, estimate of what are the benefits on the climate system and for sustainability if you use AI and automation by, and in this particular case, in this report by 2030, as you can see here on the numbers, estimates of global GDP growth, uh, numbers of gigatons of carbon that you can remove, uh, and also the number of jobs that you would create. Uh, there are also a number of more regional estimates, uh, as you can see in North America, Central America, Europe, et cetera, with some quite large differences between regions, of course, I would say this is extremely difficult to assess. Uh, it's an interesting thought experiment. They're using mod conventional uh, models, so that they're robust in that sense, but it's very, very difficult, difficult to assess uh, the benefits. So, but if you want some numbers, they're here. It's an interesting report. Uh, you can see how they dive deeper into agriculture, water infrastructure, et cetera, it gives you a couple of examples. But in terms of numbers, I would never uh, be so confident with saying some plus five comma four. I think that to me is a little bit too detailed. What I think, think is important as well here is the fact that we should not only discuss and get excited about opportunities, but also tackle some of the sustainability risks associated with the development and use of AI and do that hands-on and tackle those in an explicit and open way. I don't see that happening too much at the moment, at least not in the sustainability domain. But if I, I can just raise four of them, of course, we know this is a big debate within um, research about responsible AI or ethical AI, issues around uh, algorithmic bias and discrimination. I mean, that little, little image is from one article that was published in Science two years ago about an um, algorithm use in the US, US, 200 million people every year uh, were filtered through this algorithm that allocated healthcare to very complex medical cases and actually discovered that it had discriminatory impacts against people of color. So what would be those potential algorithmic bias if we start to use AI systems for issues related to sustainability? I mean, that I think we should talk about that openly and try to address that proactively. Another aspect that I think is important to be aware of is, of course, unequal access to these technologies. Um, there might be some potential, for example, to use AI systems uh, for farming. But of course, around the world, people don't have access to that, those kinds of technologies and benefits. And another aspect to it is who's developing AI uh, as a field. Uh, as you can see from the data, it is the global north. It's rich countries. Uh, it's the corporate domain. And what are the potential drawbacks of that unequal access and development type of aspects? 3.3, 3, a little bit of elephant in the room. And I think that elephant is growing over time in the AI domain is the carbon footprint, material footprint of developing these models. This was something that I wasn't really worried about uh, a year ago, but now seeing that with the growth 
of these models with so many parameters being computed and the computing power needed, the carbon footprint is going to be a concern and the material footprint of the hardware will be a concern. Uh, so how do we tackle that proactively to make sure that it's not only, uh, AI is not only used for sustainability, but also in itself is developed in a sustainable way. I think it's a big challenge. And then another issue that we don't discuss very often, uh, but I think is important is the fact that AI and digitalization actually is a big market in sectors that we actually would not like to see expanded. For example, extraction of fossil fuels. I saw an estimate showing that the fossil fuel industry uh, would benefit around 150 billion US dollars in the next five years, thanks to digitization and, and clever uses of AI. This is the kind of activities that we need to face out if we are to create a stable climate future for people. I think these topics are risks. These are drawbacks. These are challenges for sustainability created by AI and digitalization. Let's be open about them and tackle them proactively. And at the same time, uh, work on, on projects that boost uh, and accelerate sustainability. So just to wrap up, um, I'm soon into my 20 minutes. I think there is a big and very important discussion about responsible AI. I, I see that taking off in serious ways, being taken up by companies and, and, and policymakers. And I think that is super important. I would like to add one additional dimension to it, which is the planetary responsible aspect to it, which is not the pure social, but the climate living planet. Uh, dimension to it. To me, if you want to help develop planetary responsibility, I want first point, you need direction. You, you need to develop these technologies with a purpose. And I would suggest rapid decarbonization, that's what we need, but also being stewards of the living planet, as I mentioned, the forests, the oceans, landscapes, uh, biodiversity, for example. And as a last point, not only focus on reducing environmental harm, but actually creating technologies and business models that, that are planet positive, that, that, that remove carbon, that improve biodiversity, that improve ecosystem services. Direction is key. The other aspect, diversity. Diversity in terms of different technologies that we develop, uh, diversity in terms of how we apply AI systems in many, many different sectors at many different levels but also diversity in terms of knowledge that is surrounding the development of AI uh, technologies. Uh, some things cannot be put in a model. You might actually need to talk to people and co-develop applications of AI models. And then the last point that I've already mentioned is distribution and distributional impacts. AI, and like any technology, comes with benefits, but also risks. So the question is, how do we think proactively about distributing the benefits in, a, in ways that doesn't leave anyone behind, that is a benefit of, of all, and, and especially the most vulnerable people in the world, and where risks are minimized and not uh, disproportionately put on, on vulnerable groups. If, if we don't act on these things proactively, they will not happen. That's our experience from other technological change. And again, massive opportunities of AI for sustainability, but it's also massive, massive responsibility. And I think, I think we can get it right, but focus on the right things. And that would be all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, very inspiring. Also a little bit of um, sense of urgency, right? That we wanna put out there. I think we all feel it, especially connected to the climate. Uh, but great to see some of these examples on how you can actually use AI as a sustainability enabler. Um, I'm going to steal the first question. I see now that a few questions are starting to pop in. Um, but you were mentioning the compute and storage and the, the basically also the electricity needed to have these AI models being trained, etc. Mm. So and you mentioned we have to be proactive on how to tackle it. Have you put any thought on how to actually do that? We're talking a lot about this problem, uh, for example, within blockchain, etc. And uh, and what are your thoughts on that? 
I mean, I, I don't think they have a solution for it because I don't think there is a solution. I, I think I think there is a technical aspect to it, right? And as and you know this way better than I do. I mean, there are, there are ways that you can design these systems in a way that are not only about accuracy but also about efficiency in terms of resource use. Uh, I think the the race so far have just been if you talk about, for example, language models, just a big bigger bigger models, without thinking about so actually how uh, what are the what's the footprint of these models that's not been a, a major issue i think that's a big big topic there are probably technical solutions to it the other aspect which is much more difficult is what should we use these models for right because sometimes the footprint material and carbon footprint might be big but it's motivated because the purpose the use of that technology is for something good and then we would accept it there's a big difference uh between you know using energy and, and consumptions to to produce a doge coin like a crypto coin or launching a satellite i think launching a satellite probably has a bigger footprint but it, it is it has a big a different purpose that might be a bigger use for more people you know and i think we we need to have that discussion too and um, we have a question here from uh, the audience uh, that is kind of touching upon this a little bit. So what do you put in the term dark machines? Maybe this touches a little bit on, on that, do you know, uh, actually the purpose of using AI. But are you familiar with the term dark machines? If I am, I, th I think the question came to me because I'm, I, the book I'm working on is called Dark Machines. So it, it is the working title. Of it. And I think the, the way I, I explore it is the fact that dark refers to different things. It, it can be dark in terms of limited transparency. I think, you know, everyone working in the field of AI know, knows the challenges around uh, black box uh, AI systems, et cetera, and what that means. Uh, it can be dark machines can be dark by the intentions. So essentially they are produced to, to manipulate, uh, to, to do bad stuff, essentially. So that's what I that's what I mean with dark machines. It, it's essentially just the working title for the book I'm working on. So it doesn't have like a technical definition. All right. So when can we expect uh, that book to be out? Hopefully next year. Hopefully next year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned. Um, but I want to go back a little bit to the topic again with uh, the consumption of energy for these machines. Uh, um, we have worked a little bit together through AI Sweden and uh, Stockholm Resilience Center is one of the partners there. Um, and you were mentioning to me that there are, for example, ways of controlling or tools that can help you, for example, you do your uh, compute at times of the day where the energy level in general is lower, for example, or when it's cheaper or better to basically use mm -hmm. energy at, and then compared to other times. Mm -hmm. Do you just want to elaborate a little bit on those tools that are already out there? You know, to be honest, I, I'm not an expert on those particular things. I know they exist. Uh, I know that there's space for this whole sector to think think this through properly. We've had discussions about this in, in other groups, the fact that if you're setting up something related to AI and sustainability and climate change, you need to have a carbon goal for your organization. You, you, you need to get to net zero emissions in what you do. And there are technical ways that you can do it, I, I would assume, and I think, or needs to be developed. What I'm more worried about is actually the more indirect secondary impacts of uses of these technologies, which are much more difficult to assess. I mean, if you think about 15 years ago, when social media erupted, our, the biggest concern was not the carbon footprint of social media at the moment. That's not the biggest concern now. It's more like, how does it change the public discourse digitally? How does it affect politics, et cetera, et cetera? I think we will be in the same position when we talk about AI. Not a little worry about the carbon footprint, but more the indirect complex effects in the long term. Thank you. So uh, let's see if we can find some of these tools that can help us at least to measure or, or use uh, the compute and storage in, in better ways. Uh, we have a question here good. in the yeah in the in the chat. Um, if you know of any examples where AI have been applied to create regenerative systems that are planet positive. 
So can you give any uh, examples where AI actually has done this? That's a very good question. I, I think, I mean, most of the, I have to say that mo most of the cases that you find out there are about reducing energy consumption and resource consumption, which I think is good. I think that's fine. I've seen a couple of ideas on using AI and satellite images to try to assess the carbon storage uh, in, in forests. And you could, potentially use that to, to work more regenerative because then you will be able to see like on this landscape, actually the carbon storage uh, possibilities are way bigger. So that means that you could start uh, investing that and, and become more active stewards of that landscape to boost biodiversity and carbon storage and local livelihoods, right? Because there are very few actually forests where people don't live. So that, that tends to be local communities. So that needs to be included as well. But good good question, and I, I will uh, think about that better for next time and give you more examples. We have another one here. Um, what is the leading global or national forum that are discussing these questions? And how do we progress in these questions? Uh, what leaders or organizations need to act? Is there a national forum for these questions uh, that you've seen? National or international? Yeah, exactly. Global no. or national forums. So maybe let's make yeah. it into two questions. <laughs> okay, no, but I, I think at the moment there's no, I wouldn't say there's a clear big arena for this. I mean, let me just mention two, but I think we would need more. I think one is there is an initiative at the UN level um, by the, I think the International Telecommunication Union, ETU, called AI for Good. Right, so AI for good, it's not only a brand, it's also uh, increasingly a project. You get much more than climate and sustainability there. You get all things that are good, you know, education, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be one. There's an, there's an interesting initiative that actually was built bottom up called Climate Change AI by young scientists. Uh, I think they have a webpage, they have a synthesis article, that came out two years ago. I think it's about 90 pages long with examples. That's a growing community. Uh, and then there are a couple of uh, big tech companies. And I'm not going to mention them because they haven't paid me to make uh, <laughs> to advertise the work that are doing some quite interesting work, even though it, it's uh, in its early days. Uh, so my question is, my answer, short answer, I don't see like a very clear international arena, but it's happening. I mean, it's moving. It's, it's here and there. National arena, we need to build it. I mean, in, in Sweden, we haven't done it yet. We, a couple of us have proposed it, AI Sweden. We did it together with RISE. Uh, it's it's a low hanging fruit, but we haven't created that yet. Could we do it, you think, uh, Pan Nordic? We're talking a lot about the new Nordics, for example, collaborating over this, uh, the Nordics and the Baltic countries, for example. Would that be a good idea? Yes. Yeah, for sure. I, th I think there is uh, there's a space to be filled there. Uh, yeah. Very good. We have another question. Apparently, AI will be positively contributing to environmental dimensions of sustainability. Uh, how could it be affecting the economic and social dimensions? That's a big question. And, and I think it, it will depend who you ask. So if you allow me to simplify it, there will be different camps. So one camp will probably say, thanks to the digitization, automation, data-driven analysis and AI, we will create marvelous prosperity. Uh, for for all, I, I'm putting that a little bit harsh, maybe. And then there will be other communities that will point at actually automation could lead to job loss that we need to manage. Uh, AI systems can and are already being used for bad stuff like warfare, <laughs> quicker extraction of, of fossil fuels, etc., and and could undermine democracy as well. So it's, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that science has a very clear answer of, of what will happen in those dimensions. And 
that boils down to what what do we want to make out of this technology thank you and um, you were mentioning in your presentation uh, for example, the textile industry and uh, how you can work with circular economy, for example. Uh, do you have any examples of uh, organizations or companies? Now we don't want to mention any names. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you have uh, some examples of uh, maybe industry-wise, how, how you've seen examples of this. Right. It, get, it gets silly if we don't mention companies. So that, that would be my bad. Let's put it this way. I think some of the companies that are way ahead in this. I would say Microsoft has done very impressive work. Uh, they call it AI for Earth um, and published a couple of interesting studies if, you, if you're interested in AI for climate change and sustainability space. I think in terms of textiles and supply chains, etc., cetera, uh, H&M has been done a couple of interesting pilots uh, to, to make supply chains more efficient, uh, minimize the stock they use, uh, minimize uh, uh, waste, etc. Um, but I would say these are all like very early, early days for this space. I think the potential is much, much bigger, and there's a lot of space for other companies to learn and and, and start their own journey. That sounds good and encouraging. And and uh, last, just before we wrap up, uh, would you? Uh, who are you working with internationally on these questions? So your Stockholm Resilience Center. Are there any similar centers like yours out there or who are you collaborating with? So I would say in Sweden, AI Sweden and RICE all would be our closest collaborators. Internationally, we have close collaborations. I mean, we have lots, lots of collaborations, but on, on this particular topic and close collaborations, be with, uh, with colleagues at Princeton University um, and also at the new school in New York, uh, something called the Urban Systems Lab. So, so for us, those are, would be our closest collaborations. Uh, we also had very deep engagements to, with something called CGIR platform for big data in agriculture. It gets a, a little bit technical here, but it's a big international uh, group of researchers and practitioners in the field of uh, agriculture. And they have a platform where they innovate and explore the uses of AI and digital tech for uh, agriculture, and especially with a focus on the global south, which I think is important. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you'll be staying on for a little bit. If there are more questions, uh, maybe you'll have the chance to type in some answers. Uh, but we thank you so much, Victor, for, for sharing this, both your knowledge and also inspiring us to actually uh, make the moves that are needed. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I now want to welcome our panel. So if we can have uh, Annette Nordvall, uh, Payman, Momeni, and Suhini Roy Chaudhry. Are you all there? Seen you guys. We are. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Great to have you. Good so you. let's start uh, with a round of introductions, so we get to know you guys. And should we start perhaps with Annette? Well, thank you, you so much for having me. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, located in Stockholm, in Sweden, and I'm an early stage tech investor. I've been investing for the past plus thirty years uh, in mostly hardware and software components. Uh, so this is a crucial point now where we actually can add other smart uh, attributions to uh, how we actually are measuring data and, and how to do work with it and so forth. So I'm very excited to be here today. Um, chairwoman for several different technical companies, but also for uh, one of Victor uh, that we work together with, it, which is We Don't Have Time which is one of the platforms that we could use and uh, broadcast information regarding technology and exponential roadmap. I saw some of the uh, things that was talking about in, in the chat and so forth. And we do actually uh, broadcast those um, information. So it's more about adding people to the same platform and then having good conversation and exchanges in between the organizations and the obviously the different uh, backgrounds where we come from and so forth from all the different uh, perspectives. So um, we're ex I'm excited to be here today. Thank you for having me. 
Thank you, Annette. We're really happy to have you. So if we go to Suhini Roshadri, uh, welcome. Good Thank morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> I'm in California. So thanks, guys, for including me. Um, well, I, I was a professor in, in, the, in my last life, I would say. Uh, my, my field was uh, computer vision, medical imaging, uh, machine learning for medical imaging domain. And then I moved to industry, uh, Volvo Cars. And at Volvo Cars, I, I was working in the autonomous drive team. Then I became the senior manager for it. And then I headed the university relations team where we were you know, collaborating with the universities on, on various AI and ML projects. And then I transitioned to Fourth Brain. Fourth Brain uh, is a startup. Uh, again, it, it was an early initiative last year. And it's on uh, upskilling people for AI and machine learning. Um, currently, I am transitioning from that to a, a bigger company again, but um, I'll leave that for later. So, yeah, as a part of AI uh, and upskilling and uh, understanding what is happening in the Silicon Valley sp specifically. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, really excited about uh, what this new uh, thing is going to be. But we're really happy to have you um, all the way from California. Thanks so much for, for being here. And then uh, Payman. Good evening. Great. Great, thank you. No, no, based in Stockholm. Uh, so my name is uh, Peyman Mumeni. I'm heading the sales team at Peltarion. Um, Peltarion is a company based here in Stockholm, Sweden. We work with uh, enabling corporations and individuals to start working with advanced AI. Uh, we would do that in various ways. We have a platform and we also have enablement programs where, where, which we uh, run with with various with companies in various sizes and different segments, so we are you know embedded in uh, a lot of the projects that are ongoing in the Swedish landscape when it comes to AI, and we are working diligently of you know broadening the know-how and the skills for AI across organizations, but also on an individual level, helping you know founders of small startups and individuals that have ideas or projects that they want to realize with the help of AI. We are there to support them as well. And me myself, I have a background from from ABB, uh, spending many spent many years at, at in the industry working at the power sector, where there's a lot of potential for using AI for you know env env environmental sustainability. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you guys have a really good uh, kind of all of you have split backgrounds or uh, so much experience from different industries. So this is going to be a really fun uh, discussion to hear your thoughts on how AI can be a sustainability enabler. And Payman, if I can start with you in general, how do you see that AI can be used um, from the field where you're in right now mm -hmm. to help companies become more sustainable? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and to some extent, you know, Victor was, was talking about this, where, where companies are right now. What we are seeing, in, in I'm, I'm talking about the Swedish and the Northern Europe perspective, that's where we are most active, is that a lot of companies have not yet really started or they are just about to start. There are some companies that are a bit more ahead of the curve, but still for them, the importance is to trying to realize and get value, you know, economic value out of AI still to prove that it's a, it's a viable technology and that it works, you know, getting beyond the hype. But still, you know, uh, looking at how a lot of these companies are governed and run, uh, they are having a lot of sustainability goals. And, and looking, of, looking at what AI really does, I mean, it's a way to optimize, to augment, to improve, to automate processes, being, you know, adding more intelligence to the table, making, you know, the users of the AI technologies, uh, enabling them to make more intelligent decisions. And that in turn will, of course, create economic value, but in most cases, it will also create a sustainable value. Victor was talking about is how do you measure, you know, the sustainable impact that you have. And what we are talking about is the sustainable return of investment, because as Victor was saying, and you, you also asked about a couple of questions about that, the AI itself, the training and the inference and all those things do uh, consume a lot of power, but we are seeing a lot of nice, you know, return on that investment still. So hence, that is really what AI can do. And looking at, you know, reports, uh, scientific papers, and you know, drawing the line to the SDGs that we have, the 17 points from, from the United Nations, all of them are indicating that AI will be an enabler to reach those goals. Thank you so much. So if I can pass that same question on to Annette first, 
uh, from your, I mean, you're looking into so many different industries, but mm -hmm. uh, tech focus. What, what do you see? Uh, is there hope out there that we will get some good AI to help us? Well, I hope so. <laughs> That's what I'm sort of by the diligence processes and so forth that I am uh, when we're reviewing companies has been prior to COVID, everybody was talking, oh, machine learning, and then we have machine learning, and then you go like, and that means what? Is there something that you can add as um, a component that actually becomes something out of it? Because accumulating data, I know we heard that would be the next uh, level of gold mine for many, many years. Uh, but eventually, when you have all that information that you collect for something, what is it, is it actually doing anything or can you actually get something out of it? So there's a lot of power of, you know, accumulating all this data, but then it's sort of like a lot of shit in and not so much shit out, excuse my language, but that's sort of what it becomes. Uh, so for me, it's more for or for us in I mean, understand here that I invest very early. So I actually go in with friends, family and fools. That's where I invest when I think there is an opportunity where I see a shift of change. My main goal is not necessarily to earn a lot of money, which sounds very weird to a lot of people, but it's actually to help put push sort of the, the milestone a little bit further ahead on the strategic side of what can we actually innovate and why are we doing certain things? And you, I have to pay sort of and play a little bit and then participate in uh, and sort of form the future. And I see that one of the investment that we recently did uh, that he is uh, attending here, he probably has a lot of opinions on what I'm stating, but the reason why we invested in specifically that company was because they're brilliant scientists that actually, and engineers that understand how to, um, to form data into something that actually is readable. So prior to just using a lot of energy, or using a lot of, of, of other hardware components to collect it, it actually will come stuff out of it. And the, the plan is to make sure that everything becomes sustainable in the future. And you, like uh, Victor said prior to this, I didn't hear all his presentation, but obviously interesting that there is an opportunity to use it in a more adaptive kind of way, depending on where you are in the world. So that was a sort of vague answer on what I hear and see, but it, it's a complete. It's complicated to be an investor when you don't really know what the data is going to come out to. If you don't have a specific plan, you know that you have the skills, you know that you have a problem, you know that you have an urge on the market. But there's a lot of large companies, and Payment and I should probably talk uh, <laughs> afterwards and do business together because it's to see where are where it's spinning, who's using what, because it's early for the larger companies, but it's far ahead in innovation. So how can we actually merge them together and it becomes something that is actually, you know, solving something. Yeah, thank you so much. And I can only see, Suhini, that you're nodding to a few of the things that uh, Annette is bringing up. Um, so let's say first from the fourth brain perspective, uh, what is your take on this? How can AI actually help us? Yeah, so in, in the, the Bay Area, at, at least I can tell you the, the flip side in that's happening in, in US right now, is uh, up until the COVID hit, there was a lot of push towards a lot of different kinds of uh, ML, you know, demos, people we, we were seeing so, so many research papers, so many demos coming out, but how many ML products or AI products do you really know about? Mm -hmm. And that was a question that everybody was puddling through because, you know, a, a lot of companies, they invest in a lot of on-prem services, you know, so they, they have uh, all of the compute is in, you know, at the campuses, you have to literally go there in order to work on them. But then when COVID hit, people were at home, how do you even get, you know, all of that done? So in, in that case, since last year, I've been seeing a significant shift in the paradigm where there is a bigger focus on how do you productionalize whatever machine learning you have. Mm -hmm. AKA MLOps, that is the buzzword that is going on here right now. So data centric view and getting into MLOps. And that is something that I've been working on. My journey has been for the past six months is to educate people around in the, in the community 
to understand because there should be a higher push. There's a lot of great ideas already out there. Let's productionalize it. Now let's just, you know, make, make sure people are, are having access. And nowadays, because of COVID, everybody's at home. People are more comfortable shopping online. People are more, more comfortable with the digital you know, footprint. In that case, how do you ensure that machine learning in production is scaled so that, again, it has a lower CO2 footprint, but still you are actually getting the applications out? So uh, one of the interesting facts is uh, even all of the you know, cloud providers like Google, GCP, and AWS, they are all going towards a low CO2 footprint. So now, if whenever you go and uh, you know, start a new virtual machine, you can literally see, it'll tell you that this location has a lower CO2 footprint, and this will lower the environmental uh, you know, effects by this much. So these are becoming an, an, an important information that even the cloud providers are now providing upfront. And this is, I believe, slowly percolating in people. So it will take time for everybody to be equally educated, but I believe the paradigm shift is definitely here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great input. And and also now you're mentioning this educational uh, perspective, and that's what Fourth Brain is, is trying to do, uh, educate individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so how can you take that from, from these individuals to also bring it into the organizations? Because I guess there needs to be a shift. Who, who needs to get educated in all that's this? That's true. That's true. So the, the way in which, you know, most of the ed tech companies, at least I would say this is the way in which I set up Fourth Brain, it was the, the projects, it was always, you know, learning through doing. So we, we had these capstone projects, but these capstone projects were actually built with industrial leaders, uh, you know, talking to them. So, you know, we had, uh, you know, Samsung and, and, you know, we have some you know, veterinary companies as well. So we talk to them, we come up with problems that they are currently looking at. And based off of that, we modeled the projects into, you know, four categories. So there was computer vision, then there was, uh, you know, NLP, there's recommendation engine, and then there is definitely anomaly detection, which is a huge topic in e-commerce, fintech, and, and those worlds. So, you know, we would come up with capstone projects, and what we would see is when students Students uh, could either do one of the industrial projects or they could you know, come up with their own burning project idea that they would want to work on. So collaboration and also learning by doing and working on projects, which is actually re you know, very relevant to industry right now. Uh, we were able to see that then, you know, when upon graduation, they were able to take that knowledge further. Uh, they, they were able to switch jobs. They were able to uh, even, you know, well, some of them have even been working on the MLOps part of it, just to see that MLOps is more of an AI product. So a, a lot of companies, larger companies now are calling their, uh, you know, teams AI products. And all that goal is to take these demos and to productionize it. So we do see a, a lot of students taking more neck into the deployment aspect of it rather than just the R&D part of it, which is great. You know, having a think tank is great, but Facebook, you know, the, these companies, they have already gotten so much data. They've already mined it. They've already put the models out there. I mean, how much more can you do? Of course, it's just a, a better solution just to take it, fine tune it for your own application and use it. So right now, the big, bigger push should be on using what is already out there rather than reinventing the wheel, because that is definitely not something that I see as a focal point in the community right now. Great. And um, so what do you see from uh, the leadership perspective, for example? Do you see a lot of uh, CEOs or uh, actually uh, board people uh, taking these classes? Or do they also need to actually understand this quite technically? Or, or what level should they aim for to understand and make the right decisions? Well, I don't think uh, these, so the, the, the level of, of detail that that fourth brain or, you know, these hands-on uh, you know, ed tech companies go into, that is way too detailed. That is something just for the engineers, I would say, or maybe even the, uh, you know, middle management, uh, because then that is doing it every single day. But then for, uh, you know, upper management, what I do see is, uh, you know, shorter offline courses. I've heard a lot of these, uh, you know, CEOs, CTOs that I've talked to, they said deep learning courses are great. We get to know all of the jargon. We can talk to our engineers. We can tell them, hey, you know, this is what we want to do. We understand the, the, the language that they're talking in because most of the time there's just language barrier. I mean, that's what it is. Engineers talk in a different language. Ops people talk in a different language. Management talks in a different 
different language. So mm -hmm. understanding everybody's language, everybody has to go out of their way to at least understand what, 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 what the other is doing. So in, for them, I believe it is just more, you know, offline education, taking online classes on Coursera's, um, just to, you know, get on board at what, whatever, whatever is happening. So that doesn't really require that much rigorous effort, but just a mind shift that, I there, there might be things that my engineer is not understanding and rather than just you know pulling the the, the brake on them and saying okay why is it not happening trying to understand it may not be happening because there might actually be a flaw with the data you might actually need a data engineering team rather than you know cussing your ml team saying that you know you're not getting something out of the door it so understanding where exactly the bottleneck is so that would help automate the process more. Ebba, can I just add a comment? Yes. Uh, yeah, obviously, please. CEO, C-level is not taking the courses. I can't see in smaller companies, perhaps, but not where I, where I am. I, I think there is a, also another shift that we have seen, and it's mainly due COVID that we have been mm -hmm. sitting at home and we've been talking about of a lot of climate change and the opportunity, you know, the shift in the market, how we move around, how we actually decide to stay and work at home more than we have before. We're not going to travel and commute so much that we have done, but we see a full increase in how we are traveling. But I think that the, on the, the lowest e end of the whole AI component is that it actually costs the environment uh, or, or, you know, that it costs uh, what it's actually letting out because I think it's so unmature conversation in in the on the especially on the boards and then also in the overall larger companies understanding that there is something that we should do but we don't really know what it's do I think it's called machine learning or it might be AI and if you can't see the difference in whatever that components are and why you are driving all this data it's extremely hard for the larger organizations to focus on anything that has has a component also that states, well, or, or obviously there is a backside of AI because we're accumulating a lot of data and it costs a lot of carbon footprint. So now we have to, you know, we have to store that somewhere or we have to do a, a carbon offset or something. So environment, I think, is an even higher on the agenda than actually accumulating if you're not in a, in a mine or if you're not in a high vibration area and so forth where you actually can use AI efficiently. I might be wrong here, but I, I would like to sort of not say that you're wrong, <laughs> but it's sort of go like, no, wait a minute, where I hear it stuff and I'm not obviously not in Silicon Valley, but I did spend a year there and it's sort of like, I understand that they, there's other languages and we do use other buzzwords. So. Mm. So, uh, Payman, if I can ask you, uh, who is actually using Piltorian? Do you see any of the CEOs or leaders using it, or is it? Uh, what, yeah. what is your take on this? Our, our take. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, to some extent, really enjoying the, the conversation because this is up our alley. You know, we really do believe in, you know, broadening the knowledge and knowledge base and empowering more individuals, the domain expert that is actually out in the business lines doing the hard work. For them to be able to use AI within their line of work, right? So, so AI is, I mean, it will not solve all the problems, but it's, a, it's one of the one of many tools that can be used. What we are seeing in our interactions is that, uh, as, as uh, Sohin is, is, is saying, is that a lot of management, they are interested in understanding the technology better for them to be able to specify what their needs are and better guide their teams. But the people doing the actual hands-on work, that, that for sure it will not be, you know, upper management, VPs or C-level. It will be, you know, your engineer, your developer. Because what we are also seeing is to be able to harness that true potential of AI, both from an economic but also sustainable, you know, uh, angle is, is you need to, you know, scale it. You need to scale it across your organization. You cannot sit with, uh, you know, a... Uh, data science organization somewhere you know reporting to cio they will be a bottleneck for your scaling effort you will be able perhaps to get one two five ai models in production but then it just gets too messy and cumbersome for that team but if you empower the people across the organization for sure you will be able to better uh, harness that that potential so so i'm really liking this and that's exactly what we do 
That's pretty good uh, and kind of encouraging then. So uh, if there are any leaders listening in right now, you're at the right uh, place, right? Listen and learn. Uh, but so, Annette, if we go back to, to you and your position also being in boards, have you seen any examples already of good companies that, uh, that truly have a st strategy for using AI for sustainability? Uh, yes, uh, one of the companies that I, I invested in <laughs> is a, a Gothenburg uh, company. Uh, absolutely, science-based companies that are looking into doing further in the future and looking into how innovation will be or up and coming. We see a lot of them right now, uh, obviously, but there's also... Um, now, right now, there's a lot of proof of concepts. It's not like, we'll, like I think Payman said, there's a small efforts going on in the company, but it's not put into a full motion into that this is exactly what we're going to do because it's a little bit early, even though we don't feel that it's early, that we are working it. But it, the shift in the companies too. And I really enjoy investing, and this sounds really crazy, but the dirtier the industry I invest in, the better I can actually do to shift into sustainable innovation or shut stuff down that doesn't really work and make sure that you do it differently instead. But I need to have more money. I need to have more power from the decision makers that they actually want to do this shift. I mean, there is like the, the one... The, Let's say, for example, Volvo, since you're in Göteborg, they do, they have this enormous plant where they print these big devices that becomes a car. So they have 500 pieces of metal that is supposed to be put together. And we know that if they use a certain technology, they can actually 3D scan this. And because one of the biggest problems that they have when they put a car together is that they, it sounds weird. They have some nicks and nacks going on or it actually leaks water. And the longer you, you prolong that kind of process, the worse it actually becomes. But you can really easily uh, review these printed uh, articles going through a, a um, conveyor belt and see which components has the, the, the worst opportunity to become a good car by this method. And it's totally driven by data and it's totally driven by AI, but it's still not in production six years later. It's still a proof of concept. It's still something, well, we, and they still have these three guys that are working in the measuring sector that you actually physically go there and you put these devices in because they double check the machine. So if we can't really rely on the machine data that comes out, it's our fault because then we are just like shutting stuff down. We, we don't want to put things in production because who are we going to blame? The machine? Or, or is machine going to be smarter? And then all of a sudden, this enormous factory is going to lower their emission because now they don't have to, you know, put a lot of, of the wrong plates and so forth in, in back into uh, becoming new steel so they can actually get it out. And that's an enormous cost. It's cost for you to buy a Volvo, for example. It's cost for everyone. So I don't know if we can't, as humans, trust the machine. I don't know if this is something that we should talk about here. But it's, again, it's like, if we have good data, why don't we use it and why don't we trust it? What are we, sort of, what are we scared of? To be, that we can sort of let go and the machine, everything will work by itself. I don't think it's gonna be that anyway. I don't know if Payman and Sonia has something to say about it. <laughs> yeah, Sarini, can I ask you uh, on this? I mean, you also have experience from uh, from a yeah. Volvo company. So, so can we trust the the machines? Yeah. So, uh, what Ned is talking about, this is actually one of the one of the classic things that that we teach in the class, and this is called bias. So, this is, mm -hmm. and there are various kinds of biases. Um, there's sampling bias, there's reporting bias, but the but the bias she's talking about um, that is actually called automation bias. And the automation bias talks about and it example is the one she gave is manufacturing floor because in the manufacturing floor in, in a lot of industries it, it's absolutely automated and by default it's if it's the you know the, the manufacturer the, the manager he it trusts the machines to do the right thing they they will assume that uh, the the alarms will go, go off only if there's a fault the, it, it, they will assume that the paint job is happening seamlessly there are no scratches and, and nothing but snafus happen. 
um, you know, sensors, they may go unmonitored, so sensors, they, they, they may shut down because these are hardware. So whenever there is a hardware and, and a software, you know, working together, both of them may need upgrades at different times. And that is one reason is, you know, the, the more you, the, the, the upgrades need to happen. And, uh, you know, again, lack of education, I would say, uh, if the shop floor manager has not upgraded the firmware or has not upgraded the software, one will not talk to the other. It's just like your phone constantly telling you, okay, an update is waiting for you. But if you've not taken it, some apps will stop working. That is bound to happen. So then that there is a cycle uh, to it as well. So uh, I, I, I absolutely agree that 100% automation of all of this may be still, you know, leaps and bounds away. But there is definitely a, you know, a, a definite amount of semi-supervision that has been achieved so far. You can definitely say that the amount of, of floor time that the shop floor manufacturer or you know, manager has to go in has been cut down way, you know, way more. Uh, the dangerous jobs are not being done by humans anymore, but more robotic arms, uh, you know, being worked at, at the back end. Uh, even for, uh, you know, examples for autonomous driving, I think uh, maximum simulations were happening where a driver was back in an office and was just running the, running the, the uh, you know, the steering wheel and the pedal and the drive. And the car was actually out. And most of the, you know, Asian companies that were doing testing at that time, that's how they were working it. So uh, there is a, a, a cost optimal solution, which is right now the paradigm is going over weekly supervised rather than complete automation. But yes, automation should happen. And it is just about how much we are we get accustomed to. So if the floor manager in this case knows that, uh, you know, there will be updates, I do take the upgrades at, at all time, but still there could be one false positive. That means an alarm goes off. But I absolutely agree. The life cycles are very long. What to do in order to you know, ensure that they get shorter. Um, and, and for that to happen, there has to be a, a constant integration. And that is what MLOps Pipelines talks about, is it has to have a constant integration. So there's a CI platform and then there's a continuous deployment. I believe those pieces, these, when, when, the, when the manufacturing plant or the system is so complicated, this integration becomes that much difficult. And the handoffs, uh, are not happening in a seamless way because of which the, the, the lifetime still is, you know, stands at where it is. But for the same instance, if you, if you see Tesla, they, 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 they come up with their object detection model, they deploy it, gets tested. Again, it's, it's a new version. So I think the handoffs have just happened a little bit better. So I think that is where uh, the automation bias exists, knowing that yes, it exists educating the people that yes, there's a hardware software, uh, you know, that, that drive both. And if the, every single division does the handoff better, then the final solution will be just that much uh, safer. I think there was one question that was asked before. I'd like to answer that some of the AI sustain, such sustainable examples that are there right now, two are very well understood in the, in the domain, but less regarded. One is actually cancer prediction model. So the prognostic, once, you know, a man mammogram comes back and, the doctor looks, they give you a prognostics, right? This is how many years life expectancy for two years, five years, 10 years expectancy. That is actually very accurate. And it is one of the models which is used a lot, but less regarded. And the second thing uh, that is very well uh, understood is AI ops around uh, you know, service ticketing. So a lot of larger organization, something that is not working, you raise a ticket, right? How do those tickets automatically get assigned to, to people? So AI ops has actually cut down in Brazil. There's been a company that has shown that it has cut down the, the, the ticket answering rate from 30 minutes to five minutes. That's a huge improvement that AI has brought into you. And then that means you know, less amount of manual labor. And again, that means that automated solution is also running faster. So again, if you use a lower carbon footprint, then it is actually doing the work in, in a much more seamless fashion. So, some of the examples I thought might be useful to understand the paradigm. Thank you very much. And, and Payman, I, I want to ask you from, from your perspective, also working in the industry before and with the robotics, for example, that type of company, uh, do you agree with Annette and Sohini on these questions or, or now with uh, working for the platform side? What is your... No, I, I fully agree. And what, what we are seeing now out with the companies that we are collaborating with is that they have a way much higher expectation of the machine and its capability than they have on a common operator, right? So we, we have seen that in a proof of concept, for instance, where we are building 
models uh, that could, for instance, predict uh, outcomes, predict quality, it has to way surpass uh, the, the operator's know-how and, and skill. And that's, that's really uh, an educational point that we need to address as well, because right now, the expectations are that AI is something that will solve everything for me. But no, AI is not, you know, a Skynet, Skynet type of setup. It's, it's, a, it's a tool for you to use to solve problems. Uh, and, and the problems that you are able to solve today, um, most of them you will not be able to automate fully. But what you can do, and as Suhini is talking about, you can augment, for instance, and you can build, build products that will, can help the operator make more informed decisions, improve the decisions. And hence, once again, tying it to the sustainability angle that is reducing waste, reducing energy consumption, and so on. And in, of, and, and in the long run, also improving <coughs> your um, improving your profitability, right? So I think that's that's what we are seeing right now. And I think as 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 the field is maturing, people will also more and more understand that this is what I can expect. I will I cannot go in and expect a fully automated plan by investing, you know, hundred or two hundred three hundred thousand dollars. But you know, it's a long way there. And today and for the foreseeable future, we are more or less looking at augmenting, not automating processes. Oh, um, I think you're all really right about that. And we have a, a question also from uh, from the audience. And I want to start with asking you, Payman. Mm -hmm. So um, who do we need to think, uh, or how, how do we need to think about where we can use AI and apply it for engineers and AR and entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. Donian? I can read the question if it's in the Q&A, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry okay. about that. Yes. So, I mean, there, there's, there's a ton, there's a, I mean, there's so much you can do for, for entrepreneurs, for, uh, for people that want to, that have an idea that they want to realize. I think um, looking at, at the problem there is usually the scale. Skill, right so you have an idea you might come from a, a, a different field which is not data science which is not ml which is not you know development uh, or, or, or software engineering but you, you might come from the environmental side or or you might work within social services right but you have an idea how you can improve something for someone or for for the society or something and hence, that's why you need access to these tools, this no code, this, this you know, easy tools that, that will enable you to realize that idea because there is a lot of potential. And once again, alluding to, to what Victor said about this infusion, right? So talking about how we can seamlessly and you know, under the radar integrate um, AI into our products, but that's only the first step. The second step will be to produce products that are AI first. So drawing the analogy on when the smartphone phone actually came, everyone was scrambling to get their home pages and all that into the smartphone. But what happened in the second stage is that we developed products only for the smartphone, you know, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat. No one thought about these products prior to the smartphone. And that's where we are right now. So we are solving old problems with a new technology. Mm -hmm. But what we will be able to do is to use this new technology to solve problems and, and come up with things that we haven't e even considered. And I think that's why we need to democratize and increase the access to these tools, because if we're getting, giving people this superpower, one can just you know, imagine you know, the possibility and, and the value that we can un unlock for, for a lot of people. A, a question, can I just ask? So do you think that we give ourselves time enough or is it a few people that are fortunate to have to sit in the conversation and go like, okay, so what is the future? Because as an investor, I tend to invest with, with older people that has a mentality of what they know from past rather than wanting to simulate the future and see what is going to happen. Obviously, uh, when stuff happened, Fawcett didn't see that they were not going to do typewriters. All of a sudden, everybody could do keyboards. And the uh, Kodak didn't suggest that we never would have paper photos because how would you actually view on a photo? And Nokia was the same thing. That's the last one that actually fell and then said like, okay, enough. We don't know how to cope with this. We can't do anything more. So what do we predict in the future? We have extremely rare 
conversation in our investment group that we're looking into what is the future. Obviously, I've invested in space, but more because it's freaking fun and that it's so obnoxious that you can participate with someone that are actually cooking their own fuel on corn. What the freak? I mean, that's really awesome stuff. And this is a Swedish uh, team that are doing it in obviously in Bishop. So they're in California, but still there or in the desert. But but still the opportunity of moving that pole in the future. I think that the innovation in itself or how we predict how the future will be in technology uh, is, you know, now we're moved ourselves into Zoom land because we had, you know, COVID came and it actually was a blessing in disguise. It's all, all awful with all the, the heartbreak and all this illness and all this devastation that have happened on earth, but it actually moved ourselves forward that I can actually tell my old investor colleagues to say that, no, I'm not going to travel. I'll be on Zoom instead so we can do a collaboration. I'm going to have to travel back and forth. But if you go back two years ago, that was not even a, an, an opportunity because everybody wanted to get into the office. Everybody wants to shake the hand of the entrepreneur. But we have done seven investments and we haven't shook anyone's hand and we haven't done everything was digital. So, so the conversation, I think, should be on an even higher level in, in inviting investors, not only early crazy people like me, but the ones that are actually going into the future and, and spent because now they're like large investment companies in the Nordics, for example, they're actually investing in old stuff that is proven what's done, but they, they can't participate and say, can we shift this by investing in something else that is similar to moving into the future? There's no thread, red thread through this, what I'm talking about, but it's something sort of that stirring. We need to stir shit up, make this a, as a big salad, not just like a little before appetizer kind of thing and then be containers. I want to see more, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just blind and I don't see it because people are shouting it to me, but I don't listen. I don't know. It's like kids, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Annette. I'm sorry I had something in my throat, but um, really good. Um, we have a question from the panel that I wanted, uh, or not from the panel, but from the attendees that I wanted to direct to you guys. So how do you de deal with potential brittleness of AI models in industry? Uh, for example, the unpredictability behavior of AI models uh, given unexpected input. And uh, in, is this common or negligible, negligible, negligible. Uh, problem <laughs> in your experiences? <laughs> I'm going to put that question in so you can read it if you want to. I can start uh, and yeah, give my take based off of uh, what we've seen with our industrial partners. Um, one major thing about getting a machine learning or AI model into production is monitoring. You have to always monitor it well. And monitoring is not just, we always talk about accuracy, precision recall. Those are actually not what a live monitoring system does because there is no ground truth. So there's offline monitoring and then there's live monitoring. Whenever you do live monitoring, so if you ever go into a, a larger corporation that, you, that is doing you know, rollouts, you'll see these huge dashboards and these are typically you know, Prometheus Grafana gateway uh, dashboards. Um, so what you can literally do is you can have metrics from the machine learning algorithm being reported at every moment. So if it's a bounding box detector, it's constantly detecting you know, high probability, but all of a sudden if you now see that the probabilities have dipped uh, for instance, here the, the we had the you know famous joke that uh, the Tesla car it it predicted uh, uh, you know a, a milestone as a bur it, a Burger King as a milestone it said stop <laughs> so Burger King said Tesla wants you to stop at, at Burger King but anyways uh, what happens in those cases those are false classifications those are misclassifications so if you see batches of, of data where you where you see that you know your your system is breaking then that is something that should raise an alarm. And in an automated system, that's what we call an MLOps version one to version two, in a fully automated system, these should trigger, the, you know, this dip in performance should automatically get triggered based off of which a new data training cycle should get triggered. So new data is now uh, collected based off of, you know, what were the samples where it, 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 it was uh, you know, breaking? And then based off of that, you train a new ML model and then you version it. And then again, you re redeploy it. But doing it as seamlessly as possible with as little downtime, it should not be okay. It's going to be outed. Everybody stop working, go home. No, that's not, that shouldn't be the case. It should be, it happens as seamlessly as possible so that every single time there's a dip, it automatically uh, you know, signals that, uh, that there has to be a fresh batch of data. 
and that that goes out, uh, you know, into a redeployed model. Some examples of it has been uh, over the past year, I, I believe. So Twitter, uh, YouTube, um, uh, LinkedIn, they have all changed the their their way in which they tag posts. So if they are sentimental posts, if they have a, you know, a, a sentimental value, if they're extremely negative or if they have propaganda or something in it, it automatically gets tagged and, and those posts are, are automatically removed. So you can, cannot you know, advertise those. And these things, do you think that there was no false positives? I'm sure there were some false positives. I'm a YouTube content creator. I was creating educational videos about COVID-19 and reviewing papers, but that got tagged just because it has the COVID-19 word in it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was taught, I was contacted that you have to take it down, but then I asked for a re-review. At that time, there was a human that went through the uh, through the video and said, okay, no, it's, it's fine. But that happened. So that was actually a breakage in the system, but it was so early days that they were trying to uh, you know, make this whole system up. But now it has become you know, way more seamless. And now I make COVID-19 lecture videos, they don't get tagged. So these are just you know, real life examples uh, in, in the way that as soon as the, you know, the, the online monitoring, live monitoring system signals it, it should automatically go to the next round of the MLOps. Um, over to you guys. Thank you so much. And, and we're actually getting to the end of this session. So I want to ask you for um, a, a bit of a shorter answer, but still encouraging for the audience. How can we make the change or the shift needed now to actually make this happen faster to use AI as a sustainability enabler? And let's start with Annette first. Uh, thank you for a very uh, <laughs> vague question, <laughs> or I don't know if it may be specific. I think it's like uh, we've been touching it before, is that it's it's all about understanding the reason why you should implement uh, it into your system or the functions that you have, or even if you can use it in or should use it depending on it, how much data it is but also understanding that it's extremely complicated <laughs> to find the, the, the um, algorithms or whatever to, to make sense out of the information that you actually get so you can do something with it because it's not just collecting data. I think when I went to Stanford in 2016, it was like the only thing in the future you can invest in is data and there is data and then there's even more data. That was the only thing they said all the time, but it becomes complicated in the end. And I, I would like, we, we see a shift and we see a shift also, obviously, because we, the um, decision makers sort of that has been in the old kind of industries, because I'm still back in my dirty industries, are, are you know, phased out because of age. And there becomes new models of how to actually run um, the plant or whatever you have done before. But I think there is a... Um, to be invited into the table, to be invited into the conversation and tell them that this is what we actually see. This is things that we can add to. It's all about open-minded uh, mm. views of innovation and how you can actually use it for, for, for benefit and then to start trying and working with it. But understanding that it's not for free. So whatever you do, it's better if you can do open source and that would be awesome because then everybody can use it, of course, and then uh, work, um, you know, put those kind of, of uh, processes um, in, into the future or see it as milestones. But I think it's, in the end, it's just about being feeling comfortable that you can use it into your own um, opportunities that you're working on. Thank you so much. And Payman, a short one. Uh, how can we make this shift faster? First, we just need to acknowledge that AI will be one of the enablers, right? Uh, secondly, we need to educate ourselves on and how can we do it. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, I think we need to look at you know these um, uh, use cases that have been produced. You know the examples that have been deployed all across the globe. Uh, use them as as guiding lights for see okay, how can we do it ourselves. I think mm -hmm. that's the three factors that that is is key for for getting uh, getting AI to work in a sustainable fashion. Also, a good time. Right. curiosity, I think, you know, we, we want to implement new things, being interested in finding new ways. Definitely. And Suhini, some last thoughts on this. 
Yeah, what I'm hearing from this panel as well is is the user use, usability as well as uh, education is is the is the red thread I would say in the conversation. Uh, there was a few years back the push was more towards coming up with new demos, new ML algorithms. That's not the push anymore. The push right mm-hmm. now is to get whatever algorithms you have, whatever train models you have, get them out the door, make mm-hmm. some products out of them, mm-hmm. and create a life cycle that can be iterated fast. Uh, so that the downtime is minimal and see some usage out of it. If there's, there's no real need for creating the wheel anymore. The yeah. larger organizations have done it. Fine tune it, use it so that it makes somebody's life better and then see what the challenges are and, and keep improving it. So it's more iterative deployments that I see the, 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 you know, um, the best way to get involved and to actually do something with it. Thank you so much. And thank you all of our panelists uh, for sharing um, both your insights, your experience, and also how to, we can actually uh, make the moves to become a bit more sustainable. Um, all of the co-host organizations uh, say a big thank you to you and also to Victor Gallas for the presentation that he did. Uh, thanks to all the audience and we'd love to see you at the upcoming events that are going to happen in the beginning of next year. So please stay tuned, uh, keep an eye out and we'll definitely publish when the next event is going to happen. Um, thanks so much and we'll see you next year. Thanks. Thanks. Stay safe, everybody.